So it's a great pleasure to be here, and I hope it can also uh, enlarge collaboration and so on. I do not have your background. When I speak about modeling, I'm an experimentalist, most of it, even though I, I develop a little bit the model. So I'm using the model, try to think how it works, and clearly uh, what is a coupled system somehow behind that to explain the climate. So why long term? I'm also part of these people are looking back in time because there are lots of examples uh, of climate change, climate event and whatsoever. And it's very impressive when you look at I, I like this drawing that is a kind of reconstruction from different kind of uh, uh, cl uh, paleoclimate archive of temperature on Earth. And then you see it's a logarithmic scale. And then we are, we are here. Uh, for present day, so in the Holocene, and I will mostly speak about the Holocene today for what we, we are doing. We have lots of variability change for the present day, and that's uh, projections. And what you can see that what you're projecting somehow is quite large compared to what the health history. And then it's very important for us to put what we're doing into context, not only for the big changes, but also for the events. And more and more, we don't only want to know what's going on with climate in terms of mean state, seasonality, <coughs> and so on, but also on viability, interannual to millennium viability, and things like that. So that's why I'm going to, to do today, restricting myself on the Holocene, which is quite similar from today, except you will see there are lot, uh, some differences. And starting from the mid Holocene, where we have uh, a climate quite similar to today, but we know the forest was further north, and there is the period of Green Sahara, so that more water into the, the Sahara, Sahel Sahara region. Okay, so the outline, because I would ask also to say a few words about climate models. So I say it's more exploring climate and uncertainties. I, I will do somehow. Uh, I will show you the new results we have, and I mostly use the results we, we have here at IPSL, even though you, you should be aware that other groups are, are doing similar things. And I will focus on monsoon variability for the last uh, 6,000 uh, years. And then also have some thinking about how we can go further for uh, the analysis of all these uh, simulations. So it's very basic the way I present it. Uh, it's our modeling uh, strategies where the model I'm using and contribute to develop uh, what we call this Earth system model is based <laughs> on Navier-Stokes equation for, for uh, ocean atmosphere. Uh, and then lots of approximation, lots of physics in there we have to represent. And more and more we are moving also to our system model where we couple not only uh, energy, water cycle, but also the biochemical cycle, and in particular uh, the carbon cycle, but we also have information in some simulation with the vegetation or uh, what we're going on with land use. So it's all a process and the, I, I like to represent it like a loop in the sense that we are always thinking about the content on the models and how far we are from reality. And this word reality is really a nightmare somehow, even in the way we discuss the simulation and the way we want the models to be realistic somehow. So we, you are in France, and in France we, are, we have two of these models uh, developed uh, either at IPSL or at CNRM in uh, Toulouse. And these big models, you can say, we couple several systems together so that each system can be run separately for atmosphere, for example, or ocean, but they can be also coupled all together. So you need atmosphere, ocean, land surface, sea ice, and uh, through the physical component of that and the biochemical component. And that you can see in this drawing that even though we all call our models Earth system models, the way they are built in terms of coupling, the, the diversity of uh, physics in all the compartments and the complexity uh, in the different cycle, representation of a different cycle is very, very different from one model to, to another. And this is what makes the diversity in, in the results. So we still think it's very important to have this big diversity in the way we construct these models because we still don't know what's the best solution. Okay, 
So uh, difficulty also in these models is that it's uh, still parametric models because we have to compromise uh, lots of things and in particular the resolution uh, we can represent. So it's a rough uh, representation that uh, we need to represent the subgrid scale uh, physics in there. There's quite a lot of processes uh, behind that. And then because of that, uh, there are still the uh, model becomes more and more uh, heavy uh, when we try to have a better representation based on physics on these different uh, things. And uh, since we are here with uh, uh, artificial intelligence of machine learning and, uh, and so on, uh, you, you are all aware here that lots of questions that can we replace some of this parameterization with something based on machine learning? And since I'm here, I say for me, I would be interesting to know what we can do for the RC fluxes, which is part of my, the things I'm developing in the, in the couple model. Then the other thing we have is that because we have all these parameters, we have to adjust the models. So we have different ways to doing, of course, in each of the models. Uh, for when you, you set up a new parameterization, but also the, sorry, there's still French there, <laughs> when you, you're putting the whole system all together. And the constraint you have when you do those two things can be quite different. And more and more, you see that we are using uh, some uh, uh, new methods with perturbed parameter ensembles. You have this work coming in with uh, Latin hypercrux sampling, emulators, and so on. And part of this has been used in the tuning in the last version, either in the IPSL model or CNRM model. So this is also something that is important where we need to, to think more about it because it's not only the methods, but also the targets we want to achieve. I will come back on this. And then the other thing is that we'll, lots of time you hear about good or bad models. So this is also a nightmare. But what does it mean? And there are lots of factors in practice that can contribute to a good or bad simulation <laughs> or comparison with observations. It's not only the model itself, and it's very important to think about the content of the model. There are lots of studies that are using models that are not developed to do what you want them to do. So we should think about it, even though if the result looks like the reality sometimes. Uh, and then we have this story of parameters. So come back to tuning somehow. We have also lots of forcing uncertainties uh, in what we put in, in the model. The way we run the experimental protocol, and it's included in the model, and I can tell you that there's lots of things going on there. And then, of course, all the story of uh, variability, internal variability, which can be something you want to look at or something that prevents you to look at the emergence of a signal, a force signal, for example. So there are lots of activity going on with uh, validation or evaluation of, of these models. It can be done at the process level, climatology, different aspects of the climate, climatology, climate variability, climate feedbacks are also past climate, and I'm part of these people who trying to see what we can do with the past climates there. OK, so coming back to uh, past climate, for a long time we have a program, uh, a project that is called the Paleo Climate Modeling Intercomparison Project. And in this project, we, we started uh, 20, um, uh, about 30 years ago now uh, with two periods because we are, there, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, data synthesis that tells us what the climate at this time. And the one is very close to today. It's the mid Holocene. And for this mid Holocene simulations, the major change compared to today is due to the Earth's orbit. And because of that, we have differences in incoming solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere. And you can see it as a function of months and time. When you have reduced insulation uh, during winter, most of it, and increased insulation during summer. And you can see that this increase, for example, is um, uh, maximum in the northern hemisphere during summer, which is why we have a, a warming there in summer and then increased monsoon, more or less, uh, for this climate. And we have lots of data there. The other one we really like, even though I will not discuss that much today, is the last glacial maximum 
because the change in temperature compared to what we project for future climate is uh, the same order of magnitude somehow, and even less if we look <laughs> for some of the scenarios we are looking at. And then it's where you need a nice sheet as boundary condition compared uh, to today, changing the coastline because of this ice sheet and changing the, uh, the, the, the rebound and the sea level also. There is a, about 120 meters less than today and a lower CO2 and other trans gases. And because of that, it's a colder climate, of course, maximum cooling over the ice sheet. Uh, we, you can see also polar amplification, a land sea contrast uh, between uh, the change in temperature and other, other things. Okay, so thanks to this, lots of the data available, so just a, a summary of some of the data sets there. Uh, of course, you do not have a global coverage, so it's always difficult to come back to a global mean temperature, but there are lots of regional uh, aspects that are connected together. And uh, if you use a basket of metrics, very different measure of the agreement between model and data that has been done uh, in the last years, uh, the ma major conclusion of this model for the paleo is that our model are able to do that, so it's good news, at least for the, the big picture with Lancy contrast, latitudinal amplification, seasonality, large scale precipitation, and so on. But we are concerned for a long time that uh, at the regional scale, most of the, the magnitude of a signal in general is uh, overestimated. So there has been several years ago uh, 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 a paper by Povades telling, are these models built for stability? <laughs> Somehow, what, what's missing in there? And then another important point uh, is that in general, we do not see uh, a, a clear relationship between a model having good skill on metrics for present day climate and model having good skill for the paleo climate. So that means that the tuning we are doing in the model and the way we develop them might prevent some of the model to have the, the, the large enough uh, range of variability. And this is not only true when you look at mean climate or seasonality. Uh, we can now go to interannual variability or decadal one. <coughs> Uh, for example, thanks to uh, coral data in the Pacific. And we, we have similar uh, um, uh, responses that model goes in the right direction, but most of the time the signal is underestimated. Okay. So since uh, some of you are certainly interested in the methods for model tuning and think uh, about it, uh, I like this work that was done by Lauren Grégoire uh, several years ago. Uh, where she, she decided in tuning uh, famous, which is a, a low resolution uh, model in UK, <coughs> uh, to, to use this uh, Latin hypercube sampling and methods to, to try to see if the, the tuning she got when she's including also a, a target with the paleo climate. Uh, like the SST for <coughs> sea surface temperature, sorry, uh, for the last glacial maximum, if she can have a model that is better represents uh, a climate change compared to the one that is only tuned with present day. So that's uh, the way she's, she's done it. So she chose to tune uh, 10 parameters in the model. These parameters have to do with, uh, of course, uh, atmosphere and clouds and things like that, surface, uh, surface with albedos, and also a diffusion in the ocean model. <coughs> and what she found when she's doing that, and then you have a response when you look then at the metrics uh, for several of these uh, parameters that were used as, a, no, uh, sorry, uh, fields that they use uh, to tune the model, uh, sea surface temperature, precipitation, temperature, uh, uh, and so on. On this graph, when you have a zero, that is it's the bad match with the ups, when you have one, that is it's a very good match. And what she found that when she did that is that it was very difficult to find one model that is the best. And she end up with nine models that are better than the control one she, she used to start with. And then you can see, and then it's very interesting to see that with all those models, the nine, it's difficult to choose which one you prefer. And the reason is that you see that when you look at all these parameters, you need to make a compromise. 
And the important thing is that all of them are better than the control one <laughs> to represent the glacial climate in terms of temperature and also in terms of ocean change and overturning in the ocean. So lots of questions of how do you go from there and what we need to, to have as a target. What was the angle? Uh, nothing. <laughs> It just because she needed to present all the, <laughs> the rows. Okay. So we still have lots of challenges with our uh, simulations. And I will show one of them uh, now. Because we have all these scale interactions, so are we sure we, we represent them properly? Uh, from global to local, and from a few years, or even second to millennium and more? Um, then we, we want to, to know more about this coupling between uh, climate and biochemical cycle. And we know in the past, for example, that vegetation has changed. And so that we know that you, if you do not have this in your model when you, you want to project or whatsoever, there's something wrong somewhere. And then uh, we, need, we want to go further and have these linkages between meteorology and climate change. And I will uh, focus now on climate variability and climate change. So we are developing this model along four axes, or simulation along four axes. It's difficult to decide which one we should uh, privilege. We need all of them at the moment. So we have the complexity in the model. We have the resolution going on. We have the length of integration. So there are more and more on that. And then, of course, lots of ensemble we need to, to be able to uh, analyze uh, viability and also the uncertainties. So that's why at the international level, we are all under this CEMIP <coughs> 6 now umbrella, is to have coordinated experiments so that we are clear we can compare uh, the different models and simulation and so on. And, and different MIPS, model <coughs> intercompetent project, where you have the specialists that clearly uh, dig into all the details of one of the, the team, like clouds, for example, or paleoclimate, uh, and so on. And all what we're doing, most of the time, is a compromise between the basic science we want to do and also the fact that these model outputs are used by a large community well outside us developing the models. Okay, so I will move to the paleo and the Holocene and the like 6,000 years looking at monsoon variability. So just to illustrate uh, the high variability you have when you look at rainfall anomaly for present day, uh, it's, it's from an Indian site, I, I got that. And it's uh, years with high precipitation over the monsoon era in India, and uh, years with low precipitation. Uh, they are characterized by floods, normal, and droughts, with see blue or, or red. And then, uh, as you, most of you know, there is this famous El Nino phenomenon in, in the tropics, and it affects India with a teleconnection to rainfall in India. And you can see that these uh, dry and droughts are connected with such a uh, phenomenon. So, is it chaotic? Because we don't know how it fluctuates. Uh, is there a change in the mean state in the future? Uh, what can we say about it? And it's clear that if you, you want to do it, the present day observation is too short. And we know that we are already affected by global warming. Uh, so it might affect the result of inviability. And then for the future, the other question is that there's a lot of uncertainties in what the model project for this region. So what can we get out of the last 6,000 years. <coughs> I just schematic to tell you that there are lots of observations. So that's a period where, as I told you, we start with a, a more enhanced monsoon compared to present day. And then this drawing shows you that there must have been, in summer, a southward shift of the inter uh, intertropical convergence zone. There are lots of changes in vegetation in the north and other things with westerlies, <laughs> worker circulation, and so on. This is extracted from a few sites. And for, to be honest, there are lots of question marks. For example, for NAO, Walker, and so on. It's not that simple in practice. 
You also have people uh, looking at different uh, uh, data synthesis and reconstruction. It shows you, for example, for the leg status in mid Holocene, all the blue dots tell you that the legs will have more water than today. And then if you look at the water bodies in the Sahara, for example here, you see from the last deglaciation with uh, 40,000 uh, years before present, you have a big increase in, uh, in water in all those lakes and then a decrease towards present day. So the Middle Ocean is what is called the optimum period there. And that, but then you can see also that depending on the kind of lakes or, or water bodies you're looking at, uh, the timing in the retreats can, uh, can be different. What is even more interesting for people like me is that now we can also go to interannual viability thanks to reconstructions with, from coral, shells, giant bivalves, and so on, and different islands, and people are starting now to put all their data together. And what is emerging from that is that over most of the Holocene in practice, the variability in most places were lower than today. <clears throat> Except maybe in the and in the Central Pacific, there are lots of people now going on telling that maybe the recent period is out of sample compared to the other period. It also shows that ENSO has always been there. Uh, it didn't start 5,000 years before present, but maybe it increased from there. And there might have been a higher variability, but it's unclear here uh, in the early Holocene. So there's lots of uh, activities going on, both uh, from the data and the modeling. So what have we done so far? So up to now, with this big model I'm using, because there are also uh, intermediate complexity models that can run lots of simulation, and this is done for a long time now. But for the model I'm using, uh, it was more what we call snapshot experiment. You choose a period, you put the boundary condition, and you look what's going on. even. Uh, variability, but on a, an equilibrated state somehow. <coughs> and the question was more to, res to see how model responds to insulation and trust gases. What's the feedback from ocean, ice, vegetation, and moisture uh, in the atmosphere? Water cycle and monsoon and change in variability. And these are the famous uh, PMIP simulation that I discussed before. And we have now a new set of simulation as part of the semi six experiments. <coughs> but what's going on for several years now is that several groups are able to run uh, synchronously uh, transient Holocene simulations. Some have even done more, for example, with the NCAR model. There is a full deglaciation uh, available. Uh, and the questions in these groups are, uh, can we characterize better the Holocene optimum and the timing in the different regions? Uh, what's the feedback from the vegetation? Because we know vegetation has changed. So is it passive in the system or this, uh, that vegetation triggers some of the events we, we've seen in the data? What's the role of the ice sheet and freshwater fluxes in the early Holocene? Because there has been a thermoaline uh, collapse uh, at one stage in the early Holocene. And what's going on with uh, is interannual to multidecadal variability forced or just uh, an internal variability in the system? So what we have run with the IPSL model uh, for the last years, it's quite big uh, simulations. Uh, the resolution we use for this simulation, I forgot to write it, is the same as the one we're using for future climate projections, and the complexity of the model is, is really the same. Compared to what is done most of the time, I decided that what is important for paleoclimate in terms of differences between models might be the complexity of the model. Then we run a very small ensemble. We have five simulations, but only two of them going to, uh, to the, from 6K to present day, uh, where we tested a new land hydrology in the model, interactive vegetation, interactive dust, but I wish you nothing about it, and, and a way to, to close the water budget between the ocean and land. In all this simulation, I'm, look, I'm using the Earth system model. That means that the carbon cycle is interactive and whole half the middle ocean uh, PMIP simulation type uh, for initial conditions. So I have to tell you that such simulations are also run uh, with the NCAR model. 
They have some simulation with the full Holocene uh, from with the uh, MPI model, uh, and other groups are, are, are joining this kind of uh, activity. So just to show you what the boundary conditions for this period, uh, in that case, I made it very simple. The biggest one comes from insulation Earth's orbit, because we are moving from a period in the middle of the sand where the vernal equinox is located close to Aphelion to present day where you see everything is shifted by uh, about 90 degrees. So we, the, you are closer to the sun in summer in the middle of the sand, whereas you are closer to the sun in winter uh, for present day. And then this, there is a big change in seasonality in insulation, and it's different between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. So you see the black curve telling you that you have larger uh, seasonality in the middle of the sand compared to present day in the northern hemisphere, whereas it's the contrary in the southern hemisphere. So it implies lots of uh, interhemispheric changes with time between the two hemispheres. And then for CO2, you can see something that is smooth. The, the trace cases come from ice, uh, ice core uh, reconstructions. And then you can see that uh, it's almost flat, except a small increase. And then the large increase at the end. And I should say that zero here means uh, 9050 as a reference. And then the other trace cases. OK, so just to let you know what the climate looks like in a, cl uh, in a model. So you will see uh, by pieces of 10 years uh, the difference with the initial state as a function of time. So you start at 6K and then you see the difference from 6K to present day. It's only for the summer temperature, GTAS. And then it's for a simulation where I also have interactive vegetation in there. So on the left, that's the air temperature, and on the right, that's for precipitation. OK, so you can see, first of all, lots of noise <laughs> in the simulation. So that's uh, even though we have a smoothing there with 100 years. So you can see this cooling in the northern hemisphere due to the change in insulation and the slight warming in the southern hemisphere. You can see also that the continent in the southern hemisphere are acting like, like in the northern hemisphere. And you have increased here over Africa and India. And it's because you can see that we have a reduced monsoon. When it's yellow, that means it's uh, drying there. So you see the flip-flop between ocean and land, so that we have a drying over land and more uh, moisture over the ocean. Big changes here in the Indonesian uh, sectors. And then you can see also pieces of bubbles around sea ice, Antarctica, and also in the northern hemisphere. And the signature of changes in the large-scale circulation. That's why you have plus and minus and not only a big cooling somehow. So that's what we are trying to explore. So the first question is, oh, how can I know what's the role of the insulation there? And is this climate just following insulation? So the way we've done that is as a function of latitude. <coughs> we regressed temperature um, on, on the insulation forcing. <coughs> Uh, and then we can also look at the residual. And you have the full signal with the dotted lines. It means that for and all the simulations we've run. So that means for, for most of them, we have about uh, 60 to 90 percent, uh, 80% for zonal mean temperature that projects well uh, onto insulation. And the projection is better in the northern hemisphere where you have most land compared to the southern hemisphere because certainly of the ocean. You have places where it does not project well at all, and it's where you have sea ice, where the change in sea ice has a, uh, is a feedback that is uh, a very important one. And, but when you see that if you filter the signal, most of it is almost driven by insulation, in, except in these famous uh, high latitude regions, and also in the tropics, and the tropics is because of uh, the change in the uh, water cycle and intercomparison the tropical zone. Uh, inter ITCZ, sorry. OK. So now what's going on if we, 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 we want to see uh, the monsoon? 
So what you have on the, the top is the two monsoon region we are looking at. It covers the whole India. I love this evaluation. <laughs> I assume it's an evaluation of the evaluation. <laughs> Sorry, I said it so much. <laughs> OK, so what you can see is two simulations, the red and yellow uh, and the blue and blue. <laughs> two different simulations for Africa on the top and, uh, uh, sorry, Africa on the bottom and, and India on the top. So you see the decrease in the monsoon and you see that two simulations with very different complexity um, in the models show similar things that is a decrease in this monsoon. But then you can see uh, what's going on if you look at the uh, uh, mean, change in mean precipitation and the standard deviation for pieces of 100 years. And then something very interesting emerged is that there is a lot of noise, of course, for variability. That's <laughs> what you see there. But then we have a different trend in this monsoon. So that in India, we have increased variability with time, whereas in <coughs> Africa, we have a decreased variability in time. So this is very interesting because we have both monsoon decreasing and then finally very different signature for the interannual variability. So we're trying to look at that in more depth. The other things we get from these simulations so the same. You have two different uh, simulations. So now it's, uh, it's average for GTAS in both cases. And it's a distribution of precipitation uh, for, with time. And the colors tell you uh, how time is moving. And in both simulations, even though the magnitude of the precip is not the same, you have a shift towards lower value. So this is a decrease in mean precipitation. But you can see also a small enlargement of the, of the, of the PDF. So that you can see that as a function of time here. Uh, from the 90th percentile of this distribution and the 10th percentiles. And what is also very interesting is that finally the 19th one is decreasing, but not that much, whereas the smallest one is, 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 is bigger. So from this simulation, uh, you can already think that big event that we have seen, for example, uh, 4.2 kilo years before present in the Indus Valley, where clearly you have a shift in civilization at that time, uh, might be due to something that has to do with a, a, a increased vulnerability in this region due to the reduced precipitation for the large scale and insulation, on top of which you, you increase the drought uh, in the region. OK, so going further now. <laughs> So we use this wavelet analysis just to show uh, what can be the different time scale we have in the simulation. So again, it's only with one simulation for Indian monsoon, the time series with a small decrease, but you see the big noise. You can see by eyes that the, the, the variability is increasing uh, with time somehow. And the wavelets tell you that we have lots of uh, time scales involved there. We have this increase that seems to be only for 2 to 20 year variability. And we have some big events uh, for uh, lower variability. So this kind of analysis should be refined. Uh, but we have clearly something that has to do with long term. And then we split into 2 to 20 years and 50 to 500 years um, to, to analyze the results. So the same, when you have this big simulation, you absolutely don't know how to do that. And if you want to, to run canonical correlation analysis, uh, the memory even of a big computer is not enough. So we started with something uh, more simple, looking at the two monsoon index and their connection with typical uh, sea surface temperature indices that are used to infer interannual to decadal viability. So they are reproduced here. And then we, with these 10 indices for the World Series, we look at the EOF uh, that, uh, from the cross-correlation matrix on that. And separating the different time scales I told you. So that's the result for the, the trend uh, in the mean state. So you have two dots. One is for the two simulations. And it's the value we get for each of the indices on the map. So that you can see that the first pattern that emerged, and you need to, the first pattern is almost 90% of the response, and the other one is very small, but it's interesting. <coughs> uh, so the major thing is this fifth flop between hemisphere, 
and it's due to insulation and it's a big uh, trend uh, over all the period. So it's what we expect. <coughs> and the second one that is interesting, it looks like the warming we extract from uh, present day climate and uh, in the future. And indeed it has to do uh, something to do with the forcing of the trust gases there. So we have these two things, so trust gases mostly at the end of the period and insulation mostly over the whole period. So now the question is, what about interannual to, uh, to the two to 20 years? Is it the one that, uh, that is responsible for the change, uh, enhanced variability uh, at the end of the period compared to mid Holocene in these simulations? <coughs> so we did the same. So we, are, we need several AOF uh, to represent the signal, but, and we have three of them that have a significant impact when you look only at your in this, uh, index on the Indian monsoon. And if you look at the patterns, so we have to be very careful when we look at this pattern. It's not pure physics we are doing there. Huh? It's just a reduction of space and change. But the first one has something to do with what we know from El Nino for present day, with the big signal in the Pacific and the, the dipole uh, in the Indian Ocean. Then you, you can see also the other one. Each of them have something to do with the Pacific somehow, but different, uh, different things in the other basins. And what is very, very interesting is that I really believe it's because of the length of the simulation, even though the signal is very chaotic, somehow with time, we can extract exactly the same patterns and the same UF with similar uh, weights uh, in the two simulations. And then, thanks to this reduced space, we can highlight also if there is one or several of these uh, directions, principal components that are drifting with time. And in practice, we find only one for India that is an impact in India. So that is one that has to do with uh, uh, ENSO. So it's, it's done with the La Nina uh, part of it, because when you have a La Nina, you have increased monsoon. That's what you see uh, the patterns going there. And that's this pattern that is less active uh, during early Holocene and because more active uh, by the end of the period. And that's a number of time here you see for the two simulation where the, pa the pattern is dominant by pieces of 500 years. Uh, so it's interesting because finally we find only one more drifting. So the method allows to do that. Uh, and clearly it shows that the increase in ENSO we know uh, over the Holocene uh, more or less, uh, is really something that is also associated with the increase in monsoon variability. And then, uh, as I told before, even though we have periods of 100 or more years with big or low and so variability, uh, we can detect something because of the length of the simulation. So for ENSO, just to tell you that we also investigate if the model is going on well or not. It's very difficult, so it's clearly, uh, we also need uh, new methods to do that. Uh, so that's what you can see from the reconstruction from coral and shell data. A way to show it is to show the ratio of standard deviation so that we measure almost the same thing between the different proxy records and what we're doing in the simulations. And time, sorry, is doing this way because uh, <laughs> So it's by pieces of uh, uh, 1,000 years here, where you can see the change in variability uh, from the records compared to the, the standard deviation of uh, pre-industrial things. And then you see that even in the data, it's really variable from one period to the other with a slight strengthening uh, of variability, but even though we have periods with equivalent variability there. And that, that's what you can see, except for the model, I, I did that by pieces of 500 years. And the same, of course, the model is not perfect, far from being perfect, but you can see also this bubble of uh, periods with higher or lower variability, but a tendency to, uh, to have reduced variability at the beginning and then come back to something that is higher variability, with even much higher uh, for the very recent period. So, so the basic 
thinks we, we can get something out of these models. And now the challenge is how you compare that from proxies in the Pacific to what you can get on the continent with other sources of data, for example, with paleo temps that can also register things from 10 years uh, resolution, for example. <coughs> the uh, intriguing thing we have also in this simulation is that what was successful for two to 20 year viability is absolutely not for the 50 to 500 year. <coughs> because when you look at the modes between the two simulations, they are very different. And that's uh, for the two simulations. And then you can see that the numbers are the number of the AOFs we reconstruct. But there is no analogy or very poor analogy between them. Whereas if I show you the same graph for the two to 20 years, you will see lots of, uh, it's quite similar. OK. And then for this viability, we are unable to see a trend with the mid state. So events can be there anytime uh, in the simulation. They are similar magnitude. There, there is nothing we can extract. Maybe the sampling is not big enough. We should have a large ensemble to be able to do something. And, but the, when you look in detail, you realize that the first mode in both simulation has something to do with the CISO in the Atlantic. And this CISO in the Atlantic is associated with increased precipitation uh, in the Sahel region. So that's something that is well known. But when you look at the other basins, you see that they are not in the same phase. So clearly, this variability is something to do with basing mode in the ocean, the memory of the system. They can be triggered in this simulation by stochastic noise by the atmosphere on the ocean. Maybe some linkages with sea ice, but we are still investigating that. So that we, we really need to know how were the, the different basins were phased between them in the past if we want to be able to find out what is the trajectory uh, the uh, Earth's climate has followed uh, in, over the last uh, 6,000 years. And then, of course, we, we need to understand them because it, they modulate the monsoon for a very long time. OK, so what did we learn from these results? Uh, model can be bad and so on, good. Uh, it does not matter that much when you look at the big picture, at least with the complexity we have now. Uh, and we have similar trends. Of course, differences at the regional scale, but similar trends. Uh, we need to, to think about the methodology to compare model and data because it can be, uh, it's really chaotic, the, the viability, and there's no chance or little chance that you get the similar, the events at the same time in your simulation compared to the observations. So how do we do that? Uh, we had these linkages with mean and far for the two to 20 year viability, and we, we, we understand no more or less why and so change with the mean state uh, over the period. Uh, we need to assess this multidecadal uh, variability. <coughs> and then, of course, it raised this concern that when we look at present day or future climate, most of the time, this long time scale is not included in the simulations. So maybe it matters in the, to analyze the results. OK. so. I shown you the result. We've done that with a very uh, pragmatic method based on uh, well-known EOF or what we can do. But we, will, we really would like to go one step further. And for this, I have a collaboration with Fabrizio Falasca, who is trying to <coughs> develop new methodologies. And I suppose it will interest you. Uh, to, to investigate the local dynamics and connectivity pattern in a in big network. Uh, the, so there are different questions behind that. Uh, how to detect regime transition in space and time? And for uh, the last uh, 6,000 years, the long simulation is very important because where, where we should go and look in our results. Uh, how to identify spatiotemporal patterns, always the same questions, and the net, uh, the linkages between the different regions. So similar concern to the one I've shown 
uh, up to now. So he's proposing a combination of approaches. So I'm absolutely not the specialist in there, but I have uh, Fabrizio's uh, draft with me if you are interested, where he's trying to mix what we can do uh, with information on tropy so that we can uh, see where are the rupture <coughs> and the changes in the simulations with a reduction of the spatiotemporal entropy fields using a method he has developed to find homogeneous regions and then in inferring the networking. So the way he's doing is starting only with a sea surface temperature as an example uh, because we think these long simulations are, are a good test for the method. Uh, then you transform what you have in each of your grid scale first into this entropy so that you can see the shift in regimes. You find the uh, homogeneous region, they can overlap in his method, so that's part also of the interest of it. And then you find the connectivity uh, between them. So I will just show you a flavor of the, these new results. So we still have uh, need lots of thinking about it. So that's what emerged when you classify this uh, domain as a function of their mean complexity uh, in terms of uh, mean entropy over the whole uh, uh, period. And uh, the, the color are representative of the complexity. So you can see region with highest complexity uh, in the tropics and maybe in, in the Indian Ocean for the two simulations, lower complexity in the southern hemisphere there. <coughs> you can see also that a very similar pattern emerging uh, between the two simulations, not exactly the same boxes. Of course, if you restrict to the uh, present day period, you can do it also in the ops and compare what's emerging in, in all those cases. <coughs> So, and you see this big box, maybe too big in the model, uh, with the uh, ANSO-like pattern in complexity. Uh, it's very efficient, and you can see the shift in regime, for example, here in the box, uh, where you have this big jump here in the simulation, and where you have, uh, in the highest part, uh, very chaotic behavior there, and then something that is more regular uh, with lots of variability. So we know, now, where, where to, go, to go and maybe to think about how we transit from one regime to, to the other, what's the implications? <coughs> Another example is the story of ANSO. So we are trying to go one step further compared to what we have done. So then, in that case, it's no more the entropy itself. It's the connectivity with all the other boxes. So this is the strength of ANSO in the network. So you can infer that. So that's the mean strength. Uh, as uh, all the weights uh, you can get in this network. So what you can see in both simulations, more or less, of course, is very uh, variable, but that there is a small increase in this strength. So it's connected with the fact that ANSO seems to be more active uh, in, the, in the system, at least in the simulations. And certainly, uh, that's why we have this increased connection with uh, uh, Indian monsoon and also this uh, variability. So we find some results we know. The high variability of it in the strength of uh, somehow teleconnection, we can say behind that. Very different levels of, of course between the two simulations because one is, of the simulation is more dominated by its answer than the other one. Uh, so that's also a, a, a question there. And what is done also is to check what you get, uh, this connectivity from observations. Uh, from present day, and you can see a slope uh, in the last decades. It's not on this graph, but what we can say is that the slope we have now is not unusual compared to the slope we have in this simulation for a very, very, very long time. So maybe what we see in ANSO now is not so uh, particular, uh, but then it's, it's in the upper range of what we have from this very long time. Okay, so I stop here. Uh, I, I hope uh, <laughs> I covered uh, the different things. Uh, for me, uh, the, the question of bad or good model, I don't know. Uh, uh, we can do good science with the bad models <laughs> and bad science with very good models. So uh, that's clearly uh, something to think about. What's the target? What are these models used for and uh, what we look? And a very important thing is that the chain between the model development to the analysis, each of these pieces is clearly a specialized research topic and they should not be neglected when interacting between people. 
uh, there is lots of things to do with this model tuning because we know that the tuning might affect and it affects uh, some of the results uh, we have. So we can see uh, it as strange cooking recipes, at least the way sometimes we do it now. If we go to machine learning, it can be also uh, <laughs> cooking recipes somehow. Uh, but then behind that, we, we really have to, to improve our understanding on what is a full couple system and how to look at it. And for me, that's clearly still a, a challenge somehow. Uh, we have this question about force and unforced viability. And um, that's why I say, uh, so should, can we move from methods by, based on research intelligence and a priori on how to do it? Maybe that's the first one I've shown you to something that is an intelligent method without a priori. What we would like to do, to have to go uh, to the right places to look at what we have without uh, taking too much, uh, pass too much ways to do it. So it's also clearly a challenge there. Uh, I hope I've shown you the, that it's very interesting to add this long, long simulation to analyze viability. And, uh, and the step forward also is to better link this viability to what we can register uh, on, on the environment, because it's what makes sense to threshold and change in ecosystem and society and whatsoever. Uh, ensemble, more and more ensemble. And I really would like to be able to tell, and I'm trying to think about it, do I have more in this long simulation in terms of viability and the way to look at the modern climate and with the so small ensemble of this long simulation compared to what people are doing now with very big ensemble but on a, only 100 years? So, and I suppose it has to do with the ocean in there, but uh, I really would like to be able to answer this question. Um, and then we have to, to think about also the way you, we look uh, at model data comparisons, because uh, when we look at the climate change, we have to think that it's really uh, almost impossible for a model to be right at the right place for the right reasons. <laughs> so that means that there are different intermediate levels to look at. So we need to have more <laughs> non-local methods in space and time to compare model and data and also uh, to think of uh, how we can go back from a statistical analysis to something that has to do with the process studies and the understanding of the mechanisms. OK, so I stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Pascal, for a very nice talk. And I'm very glad to see that there's a lot more attention to internal variability and things like that and to sophisticated methods. But there's one thing. You have mentioned only once on a slide the word emulator. What I think is still missing is a systematic study of parameter dependence rather than just scattering stuff around. Uh, there's a whole class of emulators, meta models, sur response surfaces, and uh, so there's, there's already some literature on that, and unfortunately, that's not what I chose to speak about <laughs> in the following talk. Yes, I, I put the word only once. Uh, there are lots of things going on, even for this parameter analysis. They are thinking developed now at IPSL CNRM, also they're, they're, they're doing that and, and all, all over the planet. Of course, I'm not a specialist in that. I'm very, very interested to know how far we can go, how we define our targets for this emulator. And, and, and I, I put the word is to say, come and play with us, <laughs> because we are not able to, to do it. Most of people in the world are not able to do it. So we need you. <laughs> Thanks. That was fascinating. Um, so you mentioned model skill for present climate is not transferable to model skill for paleo climate. So for the paleo uh, climate, simulations, how are you evaluating them? On proxy data? Yep. So we are evaluating them using several climates. 
so that we, you have plus and minus in all the, the different climates. One difficulty with the paleo, I really like paleo, <laughs> because no, no, it's an enlarged view of, of, the, of the climate system and the way it works. But then none of them is an, uh, an exact analog to what's going on now, except maybe the millennium for last millennium for internal variability and some of the events. Uh, whereas the other one, you learn something on, on one part of the feedbacks, and I think it's really where you learn about your feedbacks. The feedbacks emerging in the climate change are not necessarily the feedbacks that you think are more important for present day. And that's why we have this bunch of responses uh, between the model when you go to the paleo. Because sometimes you, you think of the feedbacks for present day and you don't think what's the major one that will emerge in the climate change. Yeah. So that's why we, we use different climates so that we can investigate seasonality in one, you can investigate the big change in another one and so on. So, but I think there's some richness or interestingness potentially for this audience because there's statistical questions yeah. and potentially uncertainty quantification questions that you're evaluating paleo models on much sparser and not well distributed data sets than evaluating in the present day. So that might be another area where machine learning could come in. Yeah, so that's why I, I say we, we are going toward systematic benchmarking. So what we try to do there is to, to be systematic even though we don't understand what the things, but we have places where clearly there's quite a lot of data and people now are really able to, to put uh, what we need for this evaluation error bars. So we need to develop this method that takes into account both the uncertainties in the model, uncertainties in the ops, and, and, and so on and so on. And we did that already several years ago. Uh, there are different metrics in what I've shown you. And I was very interested uh, with metrics with Agamemnon distance based on physiologic. And I did some work like with that with uh, Joel Guillot sometime. But the same, each time you need to know what's your target, how you do it and what you, uh, what's your expectation of how far you can go, uh, how close you can be from, from the data you have. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, hi, you mentioned that there is a chaotic nature of interannual to millennial variability. This means we lose the link completely, so if we want to look even further down the time scale, we wouldn't be able to do that? And why? I'm, I'm sorry, because I was not... Sorry, sorry. Uh, so okay. you mentioned that there is the chaotic nature in one of your slides yeah. of the uh, interannual to millennial yeah. variability. Does this mean we can generally don't go further in time scales, uh, further than millennia, like millions? And uh, if we want to do that, how should we surpass this problem? <laughs> That's uh, any idea or any suggestion? What you think? Well, it's it's, it's quite a difficult question somehow. Uh, <laughs> at the moment, we are still exploring lots of uh, lots of ways. Uh, a big concern behind that, when you go back in time, it's even more pregnant than for present day, is that uh, you don't know what are the, the initial conditions in your model. So that makes me think about something else I really would like uh, to see in the coming years. It's better ways, but it's not that easy to do. To go from a, the same kind of model, but with a low resolution, to the one with a higher resolution, so that then you could you can browse lots of climb, lots of tests with the low resolution something, or even with the model of intermediate complexity. The problem we have to do that now is that you need to think quite a lot to the energetics of your model when you do that, and to something else is that. Um, the new energetics and what are the processes behind the heat transport and water transport that can be different between the low resolution and the high resolution. So that's one of the concerns. And the, the second concern is that we know that with the same model, when you increase the resolution, for example, you do not end up necessarily with the same uh, uh, climate sensitivity. So this has to do with this famous energetics of your model. So the, the thinking is... Uh, there's something to do, and I really would like to see methods to do that. And then we could be more, more efficient with the bioclimate, because then you know, you could know 
uh, how to sample the stuff and what are the minimum simulation you need to do with these big models uh, compared to the experience you have with lower complexity or whatsoever. Okay, thank you, Pascal. So I think we, we are moving forward now. Uh, thanks again.